Hello everyone, class is very much in session. My name is Jack from Cultaholic.com and it's time to look at the post Raw after Hell in a Cell. Was it a good show? Was it a bad show? Was it a show in which WWE Crown Jewel was kind of shoehorned in and everyone went, what's this? What's going on? Oh, that must be the name of the new Saudi Arabia show coming up. It it may have been a bit one of one of those shows, to be quite honest with you. But there was good stuff to talk about, there was bad stuff to talk about as well. So let's get straight into it. This is Raw Graded. So we begin things with the traditional opening segment. Now on Graded, I have often pointed out that rule number one of weekly television shows in WWE is that the opening segment must contain zero matches. It must just be people talking and standing around and that sort of thing. But over the past few weeks, we've instead had another trope, which is mass locker room pull apart brawls. I'm pleased to report that this week, we're back to the normal way that things are done. We're back to the status quo. It's gonna be all right, everyone. Just take that down in your notes. So there's quite a lot to talk about here, so bear with me, please. But we start off with Roman Reigns coming out with the Universal Championship, still kind of selling the effects of Hell in a Cell. And he got in the ring and basically went, you know what, last night was rough. Now this got booed immediately, and that's because obviously the Hell in a Cell match was called off after Roman and Strowman were attacked by Brock Lesnar, but he didn't like, he didn't decimate them with a steel chair or anything. He hit them both with a bit of a table each and then gave them an F5 each. And the ref was like, that's too far. Mick Foley's lying there on the outside. He once fell from the top of the cell and then through the cell and then he carried on the match. He lost, but he carried on the match. And these lads, you can see why people were booing. So Roman basically calls out Brock Lesnar and says, you know what, if you want your rematch for this big red title, get your ass out here now. And instead of Brock Lesnar, we got Braun Strowman. Braun said that he's gonna go after Brock and then once he's finished with Brock, he's gonna then deal with Roman and take the Universal Championship, fair enough. And this brought out Baron Corbin, who I must say was looking particularly sharp this week. Lovely stuff, Baron. Corbin says that last night was his first pay-per-view as the acting general manager of Monday Night Raw and like everyone else, he is not happy with how the main event went down. Fair enough, I guess. Kind of burying his own product there a little bit. But you know, we'll, we'll overlook that because it looks as though Baron is sharing our sympathies. He said, don't worry everyone, I have a solution to this mess and I'm gonna book a match that's gonna sort it out. It's gonna be a triple threat between Brock, Roman and Strowman at WWE Crown Jewel. What's WWE Crown Jewel? Is it another one of those shows in Saudi Arabia? Yes, it's another one of those shows in Saudi Arabia. Get that dollar in right now. Strowman's not too happy about this because he immediately grabs the microphone and goes, I think that sounds like it sucks. And everyone went, yeah, and it was like, Oh dear, that, mm, was that gonna get a cheer? You know, the big WWE Crown Jewel, Saudi Arabia pay-per-view, and then Strowman goes, sounds crap, mate. Sounds absolutely dreadful. I should point out as well that this is Braun Strowman, the reigning and defending greatest Royal Rumble champion. He should be buzzing to go back to Saudi Arabia because he seems to do really well over there. But anyway, this brought out Paul Heyman. No Brock Lesnar but it was still nice to see Paul. Paul said that Lesnar would reclaim his championship and reaffirm his status as the Crown Jewel. See what he did there, as the crown jewel of WWE. Then Strowman chased Heyman away. This left Corbin and Reigns alone in the ring. And Corbin said, you know what, Roman? You're looking a little bit beat up. I'll tell you what I'll do, give you a little treat. I'll book you against me in a title match in the main event of Monday Night Raw. And that was the end of the segment. That, that was a lot to get through there. There was a lot of detail. I'm gonna give this, and this sounds harsh because nothing went wrong in the segment and everyone remembered their lines and that sort of thing. But I'm gonna give this a D plus, right? That sounds mean, but I've got several issues and I'll go through them right now. I've got them written down, so don't worry about it. First of all, Roman was all proud that he retained the title, but it was only because the match literally got called off because he and Braun couldn't take an F5 each. So that was a bit annoying. Secondly, the Saudi Arabia stuff was really shoehorned in. I mean, we all heard rumors about the Saudi Arabia show on, I think, November 2nd. But then for Corbin just to come out, just Corbin, not a McMahon or anyone like that, not Triple H, for Corbin to come out and go, WWE Crown Jewel, it's happening, party in Saudi Arabia, part two. It just felt quite strange and the live crowd really didn't respond well to it. And finally, my third problem is of course, Strowman literally burying WWE's own plans by saying, you know what, I think that sucks. That was obviously gonna get a pop from the crowd. Come on, guy. And so I, I really didn't enjoy this opening segment. You know, it was a bit sad to go back to the standing around and talking and a lot of the details of it were a little bit strange and to kind of shoehorn in the Saudi Arabia stuff. 
Thankfully though, we then went straight into our first match of the night and it was a good match as well. It was Dean Ambrose versus Drew McIntyre. This was about 10 minutes long and it was full of back and forth action. It was good, it was kind of succinct and it seems as though Dean and Drew both have a little bit of chemistry together which is fantastic given that on the other side of their feud Rollins and Ziggler also seem to have a bit of natural chemistry. So that worked out really well. Uh, and also, Drew McIntyre won when Dean Ambrose did a big dive to the outside and missed and then had to beat the count back into the ring. And then as soon as he did beat the count, Drew McIntyre was ready with the Claymore kick to pick up the one, two, three. I'm gonna give this a B plus. Really enjoyed the match. A lot of frantic, hard hitting action from two very exciting guys to watch when they're paired with the right opponent. And I think, yeah, this was pretty good. Big, big win for Drew as well. A clean win over a member of The Shield in 2018. Settle down, Drew, you naughty man. Next up, we had our second match of the evening, and Jesus, it was it was a bit of a surprise. It was a singles match for Victor from the Ascension. Whoa! That's right, it was a singles match. It was a pretty short singles match, but it was Victor with Connor from the Ascension against Chad Gable with Bobby Roode, his new tag team partner. Just waiting for a breakup there, to be honest. But Bobby Roode did help Chad Gable in this match. It only went a few minutes long, but Bobby Roode helped even the odds on the outside when Connor was trying to get involved. And Chad Gable hit Victor with the kind of rolling German suplex chaos theory kind of thing to pick up the victory. Another win for Chad Gable. Man's on a roll. You know what, for a short match, I thought I was gonna give this a lower grade, but I'm actually gonna give it a B minus. Yes, I'm getting a little bit tired of the whole Bobby Roode and Chad Gable versus the Ascension thing. They've faced them quite a few times now, but at the same time, it's always great to see Chad Gable on Monday Night Raw. He's such a slick wrestler, and it's great to see him win too, and the match was pretty decent. Next up, hold on to your commemorative cups. Hold on tightly, and don't drop them in shock because The Undertaker turns up. So Undertaker mentioned that Triple H has the most broken soul of everybody that Undertaker's ever met, presumably including Matt Hardy. He said that Triple H used to be a warrior, but now he's playing the corporate game. He also mentioned HBK a lot. It was quite clear that Undertaker's still a little bit obsessed with HBK, and you know what, I think it's all but confirming these rumors that HBK is gonna come back for one more match. Not just a singles match as well, like we'd all wanna see, but a tag match, because Undertaker revealed that at Super Showdown in Melbourne, Australia, he's gonna have Kane in his corner, and HBK is gonna be in Triple H's corner. Ooh. I'm gonna give this a B minus because it was just another one of those solo hype segments for the Super Showdown show, which are all right when they're conducted by guys like Triple H and Undertaker because they can be relied upon to deliver a solo hype promo. But at the same time, it does bring the momentum of Raw kind of grinding to a halt. I'm gonna give this a B minus because I feel, and this is really, this is really picky coming from me, but I feel as though Undertaker was a little bit off his game promo wise. There were a few times where Taker seemed to kind of maybe rush through his lines or repeat himself or try to gather his thoughts. I don't really know what was going on, but let me know if you noticed that as well. I thought Undertaker seemed a little bit more human than normal, but not necessarily in a good way. And I thought it was a little bit strange. And I know it's rich for me to criticize one of the most dark, immersive, charismatic wrestlers ever when I'm essentially the, the boy from the Frosties advert. Next up, another singles match, another short singles match, Bailey versus Dana Brooke, who apparently now is gone from Titus Worldwide. She seems to have separated herself from them. This was really short. Bailey won with the belly to Bailey, and Sasha was at ringside and all that sort of thing. And I'm gonna give it a C minus because I think it was nice to see Dana Brooke in singles action once again, and to be honest, she looked pretty good. But my main gripe here is that Bailey is like right down at the bottom of the women's division now. Her and Sasha are just being neglected when they're two of the best women's wrestlers around. It's very, very sad and frustrating as well to see. Next up, the Authors of Pain came out with Drake Maverick and squashed two jobbers. And this for me, this one, was the straw that broke the camel's back. It sounds really harsh for essentially a minute long squash match, but I'm gonna give this a D plus because I think, you know what, it's time now, it's time to stop having the Authors of Pain beat up jobbers and it's time to give them an actual proper storyline against a real tag team that they can face. Maybe not the Revival, because they did wrestle quite a lot in NXT, but maybe someone like, maybe Bobby Roode and Chad Gable. The story could be that Chad Gable's so plucky and so brave, he thinks he can take on these two massive men, and Roode has to try and calm him down, and try and teach him to be a little bit more methodical. I've just, th I've just thought of one there 
There you go, use that. Stop putting them against jobbers, they're so much better than that. Next up, another match. We had quite a lot of matches on Raw, which sounds like, you know, a bit of an oxymoron. Oh, wrestling matches on a wrestling show. But to be honest, like, it's not always a guarantee. And we had quite a lot of wrestling on the show, which I guess is a good thing. However, this was one match that I didn't actually agree with taking place, which was an IC title match between Dolph Ziggler and the champion Seth Rollins, set up by Baron Corbin to try and take advantage of Rollins' injured state after the bump he took last night at Hell in a Cell. Ziggler took the same bump, but I think they're playing it off that Rollins' landing was a little bit worse. And credit, you know, to Ziggler and Rollins, they had a decent match. They went all out to try and try and impress, but in a way that was reined back from their usual style -y, because they can't go all out and be doing loads of flips and dives and that sort of thing when they've just, you know, interfered in a Hell in a Cell match the night before. So I totally understand that. But at the same time, I, I just question whether this match had to take place at all. For that reason, I'm going to give it a B minus. The action was still good, a bit limited by the necessities of the storyline and I just don't know whether it should have gone down. Next up, we had the Raw Women's Champion, Ronda Rousey, who came out, and might I say, she is looking a lot more calm and composed on the microphone. She's still not like a really, really good promo or anything. She's still only kind of average, acceptable, but the fact is, that was a real weak point of hers when she first came along in WWE, and she's improved on it very quickly indeed. So well done to Ronda for really calming down her promo game. She thanked Alexa Bliss for giving her an opportunity to show what a fighting champion she is. She says she wants to be a great, she wants to be like Bret Hart, she wants to be like Stone Cold Steve Austin. That one got a big pop, of course it did. She then issued an open challenge for the title and Natalia's music hit and everyone was like, whoa, friend versus friend. But it wasn't, it was all a trick because the Riot Squad dragged Natalia's like unconscious body out onto the stage and obviously Rousey was a little bit annoyed at that. Ruby Riot then announced her intention to teach Ronda Rousey a lesson and show that, you know, the Riot Squad are the best and Ronda Rousey smells and all that sort of thing. And they jumped Ronda Rousey and they actually got the better of her. Yes, Ronda got a few moves in because she's Ronda Rousey, but then Ruby Riot decked her with a spear, a great spear, and uh, the Riot Squad looked like they were gonna stand tall and then you can look but you can't touch, guys. It's the Bella Twins to save the pissing day. The Bellas came out and, and saved Ronda Rousey and Ronda got back up again and they all cleared the ring of the heels and stood tall. And it's obviously to set up the big six woman tag match that's coming up at Super Showdown. And I understand that and I respect that. And yeah, actually, yeah, I respect that and the promo was fine, yeah. Right, let's give it a grade. I'm gonna give this a B because it was perfectly fine as a setup to the match at the Super Showdown. Ronda's mic skills have improved, as I've said. My only negative, really, is that I feel like I'm spending half of my life watching Brie Bella on WWE television. She's everywhere. She's just everywhere right now. Next up, right, this was really, I'm gonna have to refer to my notes for this one, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to because Everything just went crazy. I thought I'd like taken acid before this or something. So we started off with Elias in the ring about to sing a song and then he was cut off by Leo Rush from 205 Live who's recently been appearing around Bobby Lashley backstage at Raw being like, come on big man, let me manage you, essentially. And uh, it seemed like Lashley kind of agreed, but in a strange Bobby Lashley way where he kind of shoved him around a bit and went, yeah, of course we can, man, and kind of pushed him. And I'm not sure who's meant to be the the heel or the baby face. Leo Rush is a heel on 205 Live, but he's a baby face here because he's aligned with Lashley. But then Lashley's acting like a dick towards a much smaller person, so is he the heel? That's one of many questions that I can't answer on this video, but I'll, I'll run you through what happened anyway. So Leo Rush cut off Elias, and Elias went, hang on, whose child is that? Got a pop, because Leo Rush is only short. <laughs> Good one, Elias, mate. Anyway, the match began, and before long, uh, Leo Rush was on commentary and before long Kevin Owens came out and attacked Leo Rush I guess because he's affiliated now with Bobby Lashley and Owens wants to annoy Lashley and that would be a thing that would annoy him I guess that makes sense, but they didn't spell it out for you really It was more just like Owens is here and he's attacking Leo Rush for no reason Then Leo Rush showed off some outrageous athleticism as we know that he's capable of to escape from Owens And then Elias went after Leo Rush, Leo Rush kicked him in response and then the referee called off the match. I don't know if it was a no contest or whether Elias technically won. I guess he won because he was assaulted by someone outside of the match in Leo Rush. So I guess that makes a bit of sense. But um, basically, everything went a bit weird. Leo Rush helped Bobby Lashley by allowing Lashley to throw him onto the heels. And that was the end of the segment with Leo Rush on Lashley's shoulders. And they were both going, we're the new force in town. Come and get us if you dare. That's actually their new theme song. I'm gonna have to give this that question mark grade that I sometimes give things, because I had no idea what was going on here. Can you make head or tail of what was going on? Are Kevin Owens and Elias now a proper bona fide tag team? Or is this just to set up a match at Super Showdown and then they'll never really be mentioned together again? 
I don't, I honestly don't know. Next up, Ember Moon and Nia Jax. She's back. She's Nia back. Oh, no. Versus Mickey James and Alicia Fox. And this was a pretty short match. Nia got the win, as she should have done on her big return with the Samoan drop on Alicia Fox. And the crowd popped huge for Nia Jax. It was really nice to see. I'm going to give this a B minus. I think a lot of people might have been expecting me to give it a lower grade because the match was a bit slow and a bit sloppy in places. But you know what? Everyone loved to see Nia Jax back. The crowd reaction was immense for her. They did the right thing in letting her get the pinfall. And I, I thought the excitement of the, the room, the atmosphere around Nia Jax, really helped mask a lot of the holes in the match. So B minus seems fair to me, but I can understand if you liked it a little bit less. And finally the main event, the universal title match between Baron Corbin, who should basically do this every week, should just book himself into a title match every week, make it a handicap match but only he can get the belt if he pins Roman Reigns. That Just do that, you're in charge, you make the rules, you make the rules. Baron Corbin versus Roman Reigns and this progressed for the most part exactly how a Roman Reigns versus Baron Corbin match would progress or how you'd expect it to. I'll let you just imagine what that sort of match would be like. And that's exactly how it was. But then Corbin decked Roman Reigns with a steel chair and the referee threw out the match and Baron Corbin went, restart this right now as a no DQ match. And that was kind of a bit more exciting, I guess, but it was also heel worthy because Baron Corbin was bending the rules to fit his own agenda. Then Braun Strowman came out and attacked Roman Reigns, but he missed and hit the post. And then Drew and Dolph came out to check on Braun Strowman and it was all getting a bit chaotic. And then of course, the Shield came down. It all turned into a massive big brawl. The Shield kind of got the better of Ziggler and Strowman. And then back in the ring, uh, Roman Reigns speared Baron Corbin and picked up the victory. I, I think Drew McIntyre was there too. I just, I just didn't mention him, but I think, I think he was. I've seen a lot, a lot of hate, a lot of hate for this main event online. I've seen people calling it cheap and uh, a cop out because they didn't want to really book Roman versus Baron as a straightforward match and that sort of thing. I'm not going to give it that harsh a grade. I'm going to give it a C. I thought it was a fine main event. Yes, it had its issues, but my point is this. If you're going to book Baron Corbin versus Roman Reigns and you know everyone's going to hate that match, then why not turn it into a big schmoz with loads of run-ins and stuff? I think they did the right thing in doing that. I just also think that in itself, it was a bit of an unoriginal main event ending to Monday Night Raw. So we go off stage with The Shield standing tall and it's time for my overall grade of Monday Night Raw. I'm going to give Raw from, I believe, Dallas, Texas, a... A C plus. Yeah, I thought this Raw had its issues. Yes, the Saudi Arabia stuff was shoehorned in. Yes, there were some bad matches. Yes, there was some convoluted booking. The booking problems now that really are just permanent, a permanent fixture, unfortunately, of Monday Night Raw. Um, especially surrounding the Universal title scene. But I think a lot of things on this Raw were booked with the best intentions in mind. So I think this Raw was a really trying Raw. It really tried really hard. That's how I characterized it in my head. It wasn't a perfect Raw by any stretch, but it tried really hard. And that for me is enough to secure a sweet C+. So that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from Cultaholic.com. You can follow me on Twitter if you want, at Jack the Jobber. You can follow all of us at Cultaholic and check out our Patreon if you want as well. Patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And never forget, of course, if you haven't already, to hit subscribe and to join us.